good evening once again, Roseville Baptist Church family, for another Wednesday in the Word at home. And I'm so excited as we continue our study here in the book of Jonah, looking about uh, whether we're going to follow God as one of His disciples, or are we going to run from God's will in our lives. And I am so pumped about chapter 3 of the book of Jonah, because this is probably one of my favorite Old Testament passages in, in the prophets. I, I love how it speaks about God's character. It speaks about how God's passion for reconciliation with mankind, His desire to forgive, His desire to give us grace and mercy, His desire, uh, His responsiveness to our willingness when we, when we are humble before Him. I just hate so much that the God of the Old Testament gets compared with Allah. And oh, I, all I see that they're the same. And Allah loves to be judgmental and commit genocide against all those who disagree with Him. And it's the same thing with your God, your Old Testament God. He just loves to smite everyone. And yet here, this is one of the greatest passages that speaks about how, nope, God takes no pleasure in sinners who continue and choose to reject Him. God took no pleasure when He told Noah to build an ark because people had become so disobedient that they had no respect for life anymore. And He was going to have to start over with just Noah and his family. God took no pleasure in any of the other times when people groups had to be put down, defeated, killed, because their sinfulness, the wretchedness had taken such root in their society that they would no longer repent at all. But here, in Jonah chapter 3, we see God's character, His wonderful character on full display. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach it. Preach to it the message that I tell you. So we find Jonah once again has now repented of his desire to run from God's will. The end of chapter 2 has Jonah after this wonderful prayer Wonderful, really almost a recitation of, of many psalms as we saw last week. God speaks to the fish and it spews Jonah out onto dry ground. It's interesting though because I think oftentimes whenever we think about it, it's like, okay, Jonah's running away from God. God creates this fish that whoop, picks him up, takes him all the way over and then when he vomits him out, he's like right there at the gates of Nineveh. The problem with that is that Nineveh is about 375 miles away from the closest Mediterranean shoreline. So if this fish had scooped him up in the Mediterranean and then spits him back out just at the edge of the Mediterranean, which makes the most sense. I'm not saying that God couldn't have had the fish kind of hurl him 400 miles. But just naturally speaking, it probably was that Jonah spent three days and three nights inside of the fish, gets put onto dry ground, and now he has to walk essentially from Los Angeles here to Sacramento. It would have been days if not weeks or possibly even a couple of months that Jonah would have been sitting there once again with his thoughts, thinking back on everything that had happened. God says to him, okay, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I will tell you. Jonah's down there in L.A., and God speaks out to him and says, okay, now the journey begins. We're starting over once again. When We could have done this if you had just done it the first time, but now you need to go, and I'm going to give you another chance. What a blessing it is, though. Let's just take a little pause here. 
that even when we sometimes run away from God, He doesn't put us off forever. He gives Jonah the same message as before, or he tells him practically the exact same words, and he says, Arise, okay, Jonah, here's your second chance. I praise God that we serve a God of second, third, fourth, 80th, 900th, 10,000th chances. If we are willing to repent and turn back towards Him, God will continue to give us another chance. But I just wonder now about the time that Jonah had to sit with this. The days, the weeks that would go by as he was traveling to get up to Nineveh. I wonder if his attitude began to check, kind of to turn back towards the way it was before. We know in chapter 4 that he preaches for a couple of days and then he goes and he sits up on a hill and he waits for God to destroy them. So it would seem like his heart was still, while he had repented of his fact of trying to run away from God, deep down inside of his heart he was still letting his biases affect his, his love or lack of love for the people of Nineveh. And we have to be careful that maybe there's a great convicting message or you listen to a preacher or you're reading a Bible verse and man, your heart gets changed and you repent of some sin that you've had. But as we saw last week, as David Guzik said, repentance is a one-time event, but it is also a process. It is something that God continues to work inside of us. It is something He continues to change us. He continues to reach out to us and want us to be affected by it. And if we don't continually humble ourselves and submit to Him, we can allow those old selfish things to creep back into our heart. And even though our heart was soft and malleable, it can begin to harden once again. Nineveh was a huge city, as it says in verse 3. So Jonah arose and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. Archaeologists tell us that Nineveh was probably approximately about 1,800 acres in size, about 2.75 to 3 square miles had a population approximately of 120,000 people. That's 120,000 people that Jonah hated because they stood for something that he didn't like initially. But God says, I want you to go to them and preach to them. I want you to go to that place and tell them about Jesus Christ. There are a lot of things happening in our country right now. And there are a lot of problems happening. There's a lot of factions that are splintering off. And it's very easy for us to get into our camp over here and then that tribe over there and that faction over there and this thing happening over here and we hurl insults at one another and we hate each other and we get on social media and we type all kinds of horrific stuff about the other. When God says, I want you to go to those people, I know that you don't like what they stand for. I know you don't like their politics. I know you don't like the way that they're living and behaving. But that's why I need you to go. They're not just going to change because they have a whim. Oh, I feel like changing now. No, they need the gospel. They need Jesus Christ. And they're not going to change without Him. They're not going to know what's wrong. How shall they hear without a preacher, Romans chapter 10 says. But I've tried preaching to them and they just don't want to hear it. How about you try establishing a relationship with those people first? Let them know that you love them even though you disagree with some of the things that they they live by. Because guess what? God loves them. Jesus Christ gave His life for them too. Not just you and not just me. He died on the cross for their sins as well. Their sins are no worse off than your sins. 
Jesus didn't have to give extra blood for their sins, and he had to give less blood for your sin. No. He gave it all. He gave himself for every single one of us. So how dare we put people into a camp and and essentially say, I'd be okay with them being destroyed. I'd be okay with their souls being cast away from God forever. I don't really know if any Christian is going to say that out loud, but that's where the hatred that's in our hearts, sometimes it's very, it, it, it's very good at hiding. We hide behind various Bible verses and we hide behind some kind of cloak of, of spiritualism and religious zeal. But the reality is sometimes it is that hatred that is deep-seated inside of us. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit to dig it out. 120,000 people that Jonah seems to hate, but God sent him to preach to. Then Jonah began to enter the city in verse 4. And he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Forty being a classic number in Scripture of a time of testing. Time to see if you are genuine or not. So here it is, 40 days now, the proclamation goes out. God's judgment is always preceded by God's warning. We see this time and time again throughout Scripture. God doesn't just like show up one day and, I feel like destroying, yeah, that city over there. You're dead. Throw some lightning bolts. Yay, for me, I just smote some more people. That's, that's not who God is. He's not capricious like that. And He always sends some kind of a warning ahead of His judgment coming. Even for eternal judgment, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, I'm sorry, John chapter 12, if anyone hears my words and does not believe them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. The word has gone out. The scriptures have gone out. The message has gone out. The warning of eternal separation from God and hell has gone out. If people reject it, it's not, Jesus, why aren't you being loving? How can you cast people off? Jesus says, I gave you the warning. God is perfectly just in His judgment because the warning has gone out. Jonah preaches with passion here. He lets it be known that in 40 days in no uncertain terms, that's the problem that happens sometimes and we need to be cautious about that, that we don't water down the Gospel that we don't only preach the love and forgiveness of God? Absolutely, we need to. But what am I being loved and forgiven from? Forgiven of? Well, it's sin. It's missing the mark. What am I being saved from? It's an eternity of separation from God and hell. It's an eternity being away from Him. But He offers you life. We have to be careful, though, that there are some preachers that have been in the past that accentuated and talked about hell so much that they never talked about the fact that God is loving. He is forgiving. He is gracious. He is merciful. There's a balance. If you only preach one side of it, you're not preaching the whole gospel. But the style of preaching can make a difference. One commentator wrote and said that the soft-speaking, gentle-toned, unmoved preacher is unlikely to awaken souls. And what he means by this is not simply a, a tone of volume. While I do believe there is some delivery style that can help capture attention and, and be able to keep attention, and those of us that are preachers should work on various uh, modes of being able to communicate the truth in God's Word. But there have been some great preachers that have simply stood behind a pulpit and have spoken God's Word with very little inflection change in their voice. 
but there was something about the, the maybe the look on their face or the demeanor or even the particular words that were chosen that would speak about the passion to which the gospel meant to them. You could see it in their lives that it had changed who they were. He's talking here about living and preaching with passion. And if you are unmoved by it, that is unlikely to change anyone. But on the other side of it, the earnestness is widely different from the, the noisy, blustering, screaming rants that manifest more of a turbulence of disorderly passions. There are some people that, man, they get up on stage, they talk really fast, they clap their hands, they pound the pulpit, they rip face, they let it be known, they, they, they just they get loud and they're spitting everywhere. People know if you sit on the front row, you might get hit a little bit, kind of like being at SeaWorld and Shamu splashes down. I've listened to a lot of preachers that, man, they, they've got some, some get up and go, and especially some of those preachers that maybe they got an accent or a southern drawl, and it kind of just draws you in, and it's exciting to listen to, but there ain't much content there. There's a lot of passion, there's a lot of bluster, but there's very little truth. It's often been said of preachers like this, wow, 66 books of the Bible. And he couldn't find anything to say from the Scriptures. I pray that that is never said of any of the messages that I preach. That the Word of God is so clearly the focal point of the message rather than my bluster or lack thereof. but that the Word of God is so meaningful, it's so impactful that it is obvious that it's changed who I am and I want it to change who you are too. And then I love this in verse 5-9. through nine. We see genuine repentance. See, this right here, this passage by these, these awful, evil, ungodly, selfish, murderous Assyrians. This is one of the greatest examples in all the Scriptures of genuine godly repentance. Because as the message goes out, as the people hear it, it says that they believe God, they proclaim to fast, they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away His fierce anger so that we may not perish? You see, the, the status quo is never acceptable with true repentance. One way that you will always know if repentance has come is that change will follow. It's not... Fake, now, this is the difference between genuine repentance and fake repentance. Fake repentance is... Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'll say whatever you need me to say right now so that way you won't be mad at me anymore and that way I won't have to suffer the consequences of what I've done. You notice that with little kids. All right, you've done it now. I warned you that you were going to lose the ice cream cone if you continue to act that way. So then what happens? You take the ice cream cone. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't do it anymore. Uh, please give me the ice cream cone back. Are my tears working? Is my no? Is it working? Oh no. We, see, as parents, you see right through that because you know they're not actually genuinely sorry for what they've done. They just don't like the fact that they lost something that they wanted. But here. The king of Assyria, or the king of Nineveh, and all these other places, all these other people, they, they now say, we have to change. We must turn away from this. 
they set aside their comfort and they proclaimed a fast. We saw the same kind of a thing in the life of Zacchaeus when Jesus meets with him. And then Zacchaeus experiences genuine repentance and salvation. And he doesn't say, okay, God, I won't steal from people anymore, but I'm going to still sit here and be one of the richest guys around. No, he said, I'm not going to steal from them anymore. And I'm going to go back to everyone that I stole from and give them more back than I ever stole from them. Personal sacrifice, genuine change, authentic repentance brings about authentic life transformation. And then the other matter that will show you genuine repentance versus fake repentance is in verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and relent? We're not doing this because that way God won't destroy us because it, I, I think because of that statement, the king of Nineveh still expected in 40 days or whenever it was because Jonah preaches for a few days and then word finally comes to the king and he hears that here comes the date this is the end time of our city otherwise this God is going to destroy us I think in some ways he sat there in his sackcloth and ashes and he proclaimed the fast throughout the land and he said, he, he realized and had come to the acceptance. Today's the day that we're going to be destroyed. The countdown is over. But no matter what, God, we recognize that we're wrong. You see, genuine repentance changes not just to take away the consequences. Genuine repentance changes to restore that relationship back with God. And I think he was so overjoyed that even if God chose to destroy them in the end, at least he got to have that reconciliation with God for a time. Oh, well, we've seen revival happen like that, and we know what happens in history. It's going to be uh, uh, 50, 100 years later that, that God's going to eventually just destroy the Assyrians once and for all. Okay, fine. That revival had generate, or that generation had revival. Another generation didn't. They chose to walk away. Does that mean that we should stop trying to see revival now? No! That's the most ridiculous thing that we could do, is just give up and say, well, we're too far gone now. God, bring on the judgment. Come on. We deserve it. Let all of our enemies be destroyed. Finally, God, thank you for, for destroying all those people that I hate. Yay. No. We should never take pleasure when people lives are lost especially lives that we think are unsaved i get sickened when christians hear about a tsunami that happens in some place in the world or an earthquake or a fire or a tornado and then they say oh good god's judgment finally came down upon all those muslims god's judgment came down upon all those uh, those buddhists god's judgment came down upon all those catholics good i'm glad if you think that those people were unsaved, that means now they've been separated from God forever. You're not living in the love of Christ right now. You're living in the hate of the devil. And if you have some of that kind of hatred in your heart tonight, you better pray and ask God to, to pull it out with whatever it takes. Because these people here, this generation... They saw revival. And I believe that our generation today, the generation that so many people hate, the millennials, the Gen Zers, the, the generation of nuns, I believe that we can still see revival. I believe that transformation can happen. Look at what the people of Nineveh were like. And yet, they came back to God, and they proclaimed a fast, and they wanted genuine transformation to happen throughout all of their culture because they believed God. 
If you think that we are too far gone that people can't believe in God anymore, then I'm going to be praying tonight that God would change your heart first. Because revival and repentance begin at the house of God. And then it spreads out from here. And I love God's character seen in verse 10. So then God saw their works. They turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that He had said He would bring upon them. And He did not do it. God looked down. He saw their works. Just like the book of James says that faith without works is dead. Not that we have to do work to, to activate our faith but an activated faith, a real genuine faith on the inside will transform you on the outside. Change is inevitable. God points out their works as a way of saying, look, there you go, Jonah. This is an outward example that these people have genuinely changed. Why are you still hating them? Why are you still looking at them with suspicion and suspect? As our church continues to grow, there are going to be people that are going to be saved that you might still have some disagreements with on various topics and things. But may we never look at one another with with suspicion and with paranoia as, well, they haven't changed enough for my like and for my taste. And I've still got some things that I wish they would change more. How about we just leave those things in the Holy Spirit's hands? Because God has relented when that person gets saved. They're forever secured now in His hand. God has relented from the disaster that He wanted to bring upon them. Because they had been changed. God points out that their work proves what He could see that was deep in their hearts. A couple of questions tonight. Are you repenting of sin on a regular basis? just as an effort to stave off consequences and punishment? If the only reason that you're trying to repent of things or turn away from them is to avoid consequences, then that's not going to last. But if you have genuine, godly, authentic repentance, so that way you can restore that relationship back with God, and you will gladly endure whatever consequences you have to because my end My goal is not to stave off consequences. My goal is to be closer to my God once again. It's easy to say, hard to live. But what an awesome privilege that we have to be able to come to a loving, forgiving, merciful God every single day in true repentance. And we will find that His loving, forgiving, and merciful arms are always wide open. He's always standing there as our loving Father, ready to receive us back. Ready to welcome us back. Ready to say, come, sit at my table once again. Eat of the fruit of the blessings that I have poured out for you through Jesus Christ, my Son. Let's go live in light of that tonight. Let's live in genuine repentance. Let's let our lives be transformed by the Holy Spirit of God so that way that repentance and that revival will have long-lasting ramifications on this generation and many, many more generations to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this night. We thank you that your forgiveness never runs out. I thank you, God, has been said in the past that the streams of our sin are just swallowed up in the oceans of your love and mercy and grace. Please, Lord, forgive us for our hardened hearts tonight. Forgive us for those areas where we have allowed bias and where we have allowed the selfishness to harden us to the transformation and revival that you want to see going on in our culture. But Lord, we do pray tonight for our country. We pray for our world. 
We pray that you would rise up the church. That you would send us out, Lord, and that we would boldly go into this world bringing the good news of your gospel and that lives would be authentically transformed. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.